after a long hot day. Cardful monument is partly 99% in place. The Marines did an outstanding job moving this monument for us, and I thank them. So in 1940, with the Second World War well underway, the city of Fort Worth petitioned the Civil Aeronautics Administration for an Army Air Corps flight training airfield. Training is a key word here. It's going to go on and on because your history of this base is going to probably change a little bit after today. So at the same time that they were doing that, the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce was lobbying aircraft manufacturers to build an assembly plant in the area. Again, some pretty forward-thinking people here. And wanting to build here already, the Consolidated Aircraft Co Corporation suggested that the Army Air Corps and the Aircraft Corporation jointly build an airfield adjacent to the proposed heavy bomber plant, which was to become Air Force Plant 4. So 78 years ago, on June 16, 1941, President Roosevelt approved a $1.7 million contract to build Lake Worth Bomber Plant Airport. How's that? Makes NAS Fort Worth sound pretty good, doesn't it? After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the armor changed the name to Tarrant Field, and it went from being a planned operational base to a heavy bomber training school. In October, July, excuse me, July 1st of 1942, the Army Air Forces began training B-24 crews, and about the same time, the consolidated plant at Air Force Plant 4 began assembling the B-24. And on June 29th, the base was renamed Fort Worth Army Airfield. In late 1944, the flight training transition to the B-32 Dominator, which is like a B-24 with, with a single tail, and that didn't go so well. They weren't producing very many aircraft, and the B-32 training was all canceled after Japan surrendered. You don't see very many B-32 examples out there. So in November 1945, the 17th Bombardment Operational Training Wing began B-29 training here. And in 46, the Army made Fort Worth Army Airfield permanent and constructed a heavy-duty 8,200-foot north-south runway for future bombers. So again, they were pretty forward-thinking in, in what was going on. It's one of the few bases that stayed alive after World War II is the wind-down. In March of 1946, Fort Worth Army Airfield fell under the newly formed Strategic Air Command. And 73 years ago today, the 7th Bombardment Group became the base's first operational unit with their B-29s. That's a pretty historic date right there. So it took all that time before the base became something other than a training base. But we're not done yet. So we already talked about the Air Force becoming a separate branch of the military on September 18th of 1947. And on January 29th of 1948, they renamed Fort Worth Army Airfield to become Carswell Air Force Base in honor of the Fort Worth Native and Medal of Honor awardee Major Horace Carswell, who died trying to save his B-24 crew. Two of them could not get out of the aircraft. Unfortunately, they all perished. As mentioned earlier, on, on February 26, 1949, the B-50 Super Fortress Lucky Late 2 took off and it flew 23,108 mile, miles in 94 hours and one minute with the KC-97 refueling. That's a pretty mon monumental task, and that's no pun, pun intended. Take a, take a look at the monument for that when the ceremony is over. The B-36 Peacemaker, designated the city of Fort Worth, was assigned to the 492nd Bomb Squadron, and for 10 years, the B-36 was the mainstay against the Cold War. Many of these aircraft staying airborne 24 hours a day. It's a pretty incredible thing when you think about it. In 1954,
Carswell Air Force Base and the B-36 were featured in Jimmy Stewart's movie Strategic Air Command. Take a look at it if you've never seen it. Stewart piloted 20 B-24 missions in World War II. He was a reserve commander with the 11th Bomb Group in the 50s and later became a Brigadier General in the Air Force Reserve. That's pretty incredible. It's the highest ranking actor ever. The B-36's final flight was May 30th, 1958 when the 7th Bomb Wing transitioned to the B-52. They're still flying. That same year, the 7th Air Refueling Squadron transitioned from the KC-97 to the KC-135. So welcome to the jet age, 1958. On August 1st of 1960, the first TB-58 Hustler was delivered to Carswell's 43rd Bomb Wing for test and evaluation. 1963, the Air Force Reserve's 916th Troop Carrier Group began flying the C-124 out of Carswell. So that's a big influence with the Air Force Reserve right here. In 1972, the Air Force Reserve's 301st Fighter Wing came to Carswell. And they were originally flying the F-105 with the 457th Tactical Fighter Squadron. In 82, they transitioned to the F-4, and in 1990, the F-16. All three of those are up by the base exchange. If you haven't ever taken a look at them, please do. The 457th is also slated to become the first reserve F-35 squadron. That's a pretty significant achievement right there. Now, things started to fall apart with the military, with dollars, with needs because uh, at that particular time we had a big drawdown and people were looking at money trying to figure out how to keep bases alive and consolidating bases was about the best thing that they could come up with as part of the base closure and realignment act round two which is BRAC 91 the seventh bomb wing was relocated to Dias Air Force Base in Abilene and Carswell was to be closed on June 1st of 92, the Strategic Air Command was officially disestablished as part of the Air Force's reorganization. Personally, I never thought I'd see that day. On, on August 30th, or excuse me, September 30th, 93, Carswell ceased being an active U.S. Air Force base and transferred control to the AFBCA, which is the Air Force Base Conversion Agency. Their job was property and distribution and reuse. The next day, the Air Force Reserve's 301st Fighter Wing assumed base responsibilities for Carswell Air Reserve Station. Now, there's kind of a, a misnomer in there because they really had the area behind the exchange where their buildings are, and the rest was up for disposal with whatever the AFBCA wanted to do. The main reason that Carswell survived that particular BRAC round as a reserve base was because of Air Force Plant 4. They had to keep it open in order to be able to keep manufacturing airplanes here. So thank you for that Fort Worth. Now in 93, that's when I got involved in this thing as the project officer to establish this joint reserve base and my job, my intent was, was to really minimize duplication as much as possible. In Dallas, we had several motor pools, fuel farms, so forth. Over here, we just wanted one. And everybody was finally able to drop their rice bowls and gather together on that concept. And it seems like such a long time ago. There were, were times, believe me, when I wanted to tell people, just take your uniforms off and let's talk like human beings here rather than worrying about what service you're from or what rank you are. And I was really a fly on the wall going to these SAC closure meetings because it was a concept. This joint reserve base had not become part of a congressional law yet. There was no funding, there was no mandate, and you're going, but this is really going to happen. You Can you save some of the stuff for us? And they, Next. That's pretty much the way it went, at least during the initial part. During the transition itself, the base hospital went to the Federal Bureau of Prisons the golf course and much of the housing went to the city, but the majority of the base infrastructure remained intact. And that's what we had to work with when the Navy took it over. 
And this is kind of significant. At the time of the decision to reopen this as a joint reserve base, we were going to have 186 aircraft flying out of here. 186. That's a pretty good number. That never happened. With the more cutbacks, we lost P3 squadrons, F14 squadrons, A4s, OH-58s. Even this base of C12 was a, a victim. But in true Marine fashion, VMGR-234 arrived at the KC-130s before the Navy even assumed command. Somebody's got to be first. It may as well be the Marines. So the project to build new facilities for the tenants was enormous. The Air National Guard would have to have all new facilities built on what was the SAC alert facilities. And MAG-41's facilities and VR-59, all, all those things had to be reworked. But while it would take years to complete this full transition, in less than a year, four officers, five chiefs, and 45 enlisted personnel established this base as the Navy's first Joint Reserve Base. Now it's critical that we remember our history and not erase it. The airfield at this base retains Major Carswell's name. And the Carswell Memorial over here is a tribute to all those that have and will have worked out of this base. The Eagle sculpted by Darren Wright. Darren, raise your hand here. Darren is a fantastic sculptor and it's been said beautifully atop the B-24 prop in honor of Major Carswell for, well, since 1995. It's a symbol of America's strength as much as it is a tribute to Major Carswell. So again, take a look at that. The static display aircraft scattered throughout the base represent the variety of aircraft flown from here. And this gathering of monuments that we have over here is probably one of the best examples of true jointness that you can find. The Army National Guard flew this airplane, the F-80, the F-86, an A-4 that's in front of headquarters, and an F-18 out here from NAS Dallas. The Navy poured concrete pads for every one of the static display aircraft that are out here. This particular airplane had a little incident. This F-80, the, uh, the bolts sheared when they were trying to lift it. The airplane jackknifed and it was sitting like this and that wasn't so bad but when they brought the helicopter in to recover their harness it blew that tail section all the way across the parking lot in Dallas and by the way they blew the canopy when they were trying to hook it up so that airplane thanks to the help of everybody working together the Navy the Air Force the guard, everybody that was involved had that airplane over here on display in two weeks and it's been sitting here ever since. Now, this was literally a monumental task moving the Eagle from base operations to here. I watched it go up but before the monument was encased in concrete something happened that I didn't know about and they had a pole that was stuck in the ground a little bit further than what we expected. Is there anybody here from MWSS 473? In the back. Thank you sir. We more than appreciate what the gargoyles did. Nobody else could have taken this task on. Nobody. Because this monument liked its position in front of base operations. It wasn't going to give it up. And this pole that I'm talking about was a fairly large pole about that big around and it was sunk about four feet below the ground. And the roots had grown into this thing and their lar large crane couldn't lift it. But the Marines being what they are, they don't take no for an answer. They find ways. In fact, the chiefs are the same way in the Navy. When I was asking for something to be done around here, I would just ask them to do something. I'd look the other way. I didn't want to know how. 
but it got done. It always got done. But these guys, in, in triple-digit heat, dug that thing out by hand, and then they lifted it, and the next day, with their cranes, with all their big heavy equipment, they brought it over here, and it, it moved successfully. Well, mostly successfully. It, the eagle had a headache for a little while. There was a weld that just broke. It was a minor incident, minor setback. It got back on here, what, a week ago? It's about a week ago. And it, it looks fantastic. And I would like to thank, again, Darren Wright and the Schaefer Art Bronze Foundry owners, Tommy and Cheryl Ladd, who couldn't make it today, and foundry welder Chris Christensen, who all donated their time and expertise to repair the eagle's head. And the eagle's head was never broke. There was never, it was just a minor thing, welding two different kinds of metal together, and there's a better way that it's attached now, so it's good to go. And the skipper bore witness to that. Now, in a moment, I'm going to say a few words about the Strategic Air Command Monument. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob Adams so that he can address that. But, you know, we had the Texas Air National Guard move that B-50 monument that was also up in front of base operations. And, again, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, everybody is involved, but mostly the civilians, the support from the city of Fort Worth, from all the various organizations that have contributed money and their time to make all of this happen. They are out there backing you 100%. Now I'm proud to have played a very small part in this base. I'm really proud to see it continue to grow. It's great to see some of the names continue to change and evolve that reflect what we're doing today. So. I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Bob is the, he's the unofficial mayor of this base. He was a firefighter here. He's probably been the base's best historian ever. So Bob, if you can come up here and say a few words about the SAC monument. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, I've been told by four or five people, make your talk short. So I'm going to try. Thank you for being here, Mayor, Captain Townsend, and all the other folks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Strategic Air Command Monument. Um, we had a B-36 here, and uh, we totally rebuilt it over at General Dynamics. And after it was rebuilt, we wanted to put it on display. The Air Force says it has to go in a building. Well, the cheapest building we could find was a million dollars. We never raised that money. So the Air Force sent it to Pima Museum in Tucson, Arizona, where it is there now. And it is put together, and it's a beautiful machine. There's only four of them left. When they took the aircraft, they left that bomb. So I started thinking, you know, when Dusty got here, he, he started bringing airplanes in, putting static displays over. He had that Carswell monument built. And SAC never did that. SAC never did. I don't think they wanted anybody to know this base was here. I don't know. I got, I was assigned to this base July 60 years ago as a rookie fireman. And I'm still here. I know a lot of people would say, why don't you go away? But I'm still here. So anyway, I went to Captain uh, McIntyre. And I said, I have a bomb. I'd like to make a monument to Strategic Air Command. And he said, well, draw it up. So um, West Cloud, and I hear some, oh, there he is back there. 
told me to get a hold of Lieutenant John Hall, who is now a major, and he's still with the Texas Air National Guard. So I did. He drew it up for me. I took it to the captain, and he said, OK, Bob, you can do it. I can't give you any troops. I can't give you any money. I can't give you anything. Go build yourself a monument. I said, thanks. So there is no government money or anything in this monument, none. I started a team. Wes Cloud was on the team, Buster Cleveland, and Don Pyatt. And John Hall, uh, I, I think everybody else is deceased. Anyway, we started building this monument. And on October the 17th of 2007, we dedicated that monument.